Now, the idea and the storied origins of Western civilization have shaped most of history and politics as we know it, but our next guest says the traditional from Plato to NATO understanding is misleading. Ancient historian Nisha McSweeney explains how it got that way in her new book, The West, and she joins Michelle Martin now to correct the record. Nisha McSweeney, thank you so much for joining us. It's lovely to be here. Thank you for the invitation. You are a classical archaeologist. You are an historian of uh, ancient eras. Your book makes two powerful and I think for some people provocative arguments. The first is that our general story about the history of Western civilization is factually wrong. So why don't we just start with that and what is this false narrative that we've all been taught? Well, this, the story that I think most people will recognize um, tells the tale of the origins of the West, the modern West, as having its origins, its roots in ancient Greece and Rome. And from there, the idea is that Western civilization has transferred into Central and Northern and Western Europe. And from there, it gets transferred across the Atlantic, especially to North America. So this is the story of Western civilization. And it, it, it's all around us. We, we see it everywhere we turn. But one of the things that I really wanted to debunk in the book is that mm -hmm. this is a story which is it doesn't match the facts that we have currently you know it may have matched the facts that we had at the time the story was first written but you know we have more facts now we know more about the past and that's simply not the way culture traveled or civilization traveled mm -hmm. the real story is much 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 more complex so why does it persist why does it persist as the way that we are taught this story Oh, well, okay, that that com answer, that question is kind of two answers. The first one is, is that the different bits of it are known, but we haven't put it all together. So we know that ancient Greek culture and uh, philosophy and learning wasn't just inherited in Western Europe. We know that it was very important in the medieval Arabic world. We know that ancient Greek was still used as a language right until the 14th century in sub-Saharan Africa and Sudan. So we do know that it's a much richer set of cultural transmissions. It's just joining it up into one big overarching narrative, which we haven't quite done. And when we ask, why haven't we done that? Why haven't we rewritten this big narrative? And that's, I think it's because it's been politically expedient for us not to. I think this is a narrative that fulfills a certain uh, political function in Western society. And it has been very convenient uh, over the centuries to hang on to it because it bolsters Western ideas of Western supremacy, um, Western identity um, and Western exceptionalism. And that is like the second point that you make very explicitly in the book, which is that this narrative, this false narrative has staying power because it's been useful to those who want to dominate. Yeah, ab absolutely. And I, and I think this is not a shock horror moment. Um, <laughs> all historical narratives mm -hmm. do this, right? That's why we tell histories the way we do, because they make sense to us and they help us to explain uh, who we are today. Um, now, the only trouble is, is that this narrative of Western civilization, it doesn't really explain who we are today in the modern West in the 21st century. I think it worked really well for the 18th and 19th century when it was a really strong narrative. It began to work less well and well as the 20th century went on its way. But now we're in the 21st century. The modern West is not the same as the West of 1900. And we need to have different origin stories. So here's the, the approach that you took in rewriting this narrative for the 21st century was to ground your story in the lives of 14 historical figures. And um, obviously I can't ask you to <laughs> describe all 14 of them, but, but I wanted to ask if, if we could pick a couple and then if you could sort of describe your thesis through their lives. So if you could just start with the, the ancient Greek historian Herodotus and how does he complicate our, 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 our notions about these sort of the inherent kind of whiteness of Western culture and this kind of clear through line. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and I start with him in the book because we often look back to Herodotus, we sometimes call him the father of history. And we often assume that he is the first originator of this clash of civilizations, the West versus the rest kind of narrative. Very famously, he wrote um, his 
big magnum opus was called the Persian Wars, and it told the story of how um, an, an alliance of Greek city-states fought against the Persian Empire. So this, this book has often been read as a clash of civilization story. Mm -hmm. But actually, if you delve into, first of all, the book, but also Herodotus's own life, you can see how that's it's just not that simple. So Herodotus himself, he's born in Halicarnassus, which is modern day Turkey. He is uh, a Greek, he's got a Greek name, but he seems to be at least half um, indigenous Anatolian as well. Mm -hmm. So his father has an indigenous Anatolian name, he has other family members who will also seem to be indigenous. So he's a kind of a, a mixed culture kid. Um, he ends up having to leave his home for political reasons. He's essentially a refugee and he winds up in Athens, which is uh, the kind of the golden um, cosmopolis of the moment. And he's trying to make a living as a, as a young writer. And he's doing really well in Athens. But very strangely, at some point, he decides to leave Athens and live out the rest of his days in a small town in southern Italy. And, you know, a lot of people have asked over the years, why would he do that when he is being, the moment when he's a great successful writer, why is he leaving? And I think the answer lies in what's happening in Athens at the time. So Athens is the cultural capital of the Greek world, but it is because it is drawing in wealth and riches and treasure from an empire, an empire of other Greeks. And what the political rhetoric of Athens at this moment is one of increasing exclusionism. It is one of racial purity, and it's uh, they are definitely trying to make it an uncomfortable environment uh, for migrants to be in. And Herodotus, we can only imagine, must have felt that. Um, and then when we know this about his life, and then we go back to read his book, The Histories, what we find is not a triumphalist story of mm -hmm. the Greeks defeating the cowardly Eastern Asians, but actually we see um, a much more complicated story where different groups of people are interrelated in different ways, where it is almost ridiculous to draw stark lines between people because there are so many interconnections. And actually what Herodotus seems to be doing throughout the histories is rubbishing the idea of a yeah. clash of civilizations he's mocking it he's showing that it doesn't work in reality mm. um, and so i think we have a lot of people have misread herodotus over the centuries because of this that's so fascinating what about phyllis wheatley i was so intrigued to see her included in your in your work until i read the chapter so tell us why you include phyllis wheatley this fame well you know famous to some people uh enslaved Amer African American poet. Tell her why does she how does she encapsulate your theory? Well, I first came across Phyllis Wheatley as um, as a an early classical scholar. I mean, she's known not just for her poetry, but for the very innovative way that she uses classical mm -hmm. allusions, especially Latin, but also Greek literature. Um, but to learn about her life put every, all of this into a very stark context. She obviously was born in West Africa around 1755, and she ends up being enslaved and transported to Boston. Um, there she is shows a great aptitude for language learning um, and erudition in general. And so she learns Latin and Greek very quickly. But by the age of 12, she's publishing poems in newspapers. And as she's a teenage literary sensation, almost nobody can believe um, that this young enslaved girl um, can produce literary works of this high caliber. Um, and to, to read her poetry really shows you the depth of her engagement with the idea of the classical past and the Western tradition. And she's she's very clever about it. She she draws upon it in very sophisticated ways, but she also positions herself in a problematic way to that inherited classical tradition. She is part of it. She has mastered it. But at the same time, she feels excluded by it. And she draws comparisons between herself um, and an a African Latin poet, um, Terence, and mm -hmm. as, as peripheral, both part of and peripheral to this literary tradition. So she's a really, really interesting figure from this perspective. And then you find that even later in her life, she wrote very um, um, painfully and evocatively about her own experiences being, in her words, snatched from Africa's happy, fancied seat, um, and writes about how the revolutionary movement in Boston at the time, she's in, caught up in the mm -hmm. middle of it, um, how she questions how this can ever find divine favor while they continue to practice enslavement. And so she, she begins to, to speak out, finds her political voice 
um, as well as having a literary voice. But then it's very sad that I, for she she has a, a very tragic end and dies and dies in penury. And you do wonder how much of that is linked to her f- speaking out politically. And there's one other person I wanted to ask you about, Tulia de Aragona, who's a poet, a philosopher and a famous courtesan of the Italian Renaissance. Why did you include her story in, in the book? She is another fantastic literary woman, which I was very excited to to begin reading about. Um, and because, again, she undermines what we think of as happening in, in the Renaissance. What we think of as the Renaissance as being is a revival, a re, literally a rebirth of uh, classical and uh, Western civilization, a rediscovery of the ancient world. Um, but actually, Tullia's poetry um, and also her letters um, are, are not are not are not like that. They they have an awareness of a much wider world. So she does write with classical allusions. She writes very wittily and in a very sophisticated mm-hmm. way, engaging with Plato and Aristotle on questions of philosophy. But she also writes this wonderful epic poem, uh, which is in, like an adventure story about uh, actually an, an enslaved young man who ends up become becoming free and traveling the world to try and find his parents called Il Meschino, the, mm. the, the wretched one. And he travels through Asia and he travels through Africa and he travels through to the wilds of Europe uh, and eventually finds his parents back home in Italy, of course. Um, but mm. all of these three continents are described in equally strange and weird and wild ways. And what Tullia shows us is a world which is not divided into Europe and the West and classical culture on the one hand and the monstrous Eastern and Africa on the other hand. We have elements of Christianity in all three continents. We've got elements of classical Greek and Roman culture in all three continents. And we have elements of barbarity in all three continents as well. So I think we have to reassess what we think of as um, re- the, the Renaissance worldview, as a worldview which is much more global, perhaps, than we might have thought before. The argument has been made for some time, and it's been made all around the world, that genius knows no continent, you know, that genius knows no continent, creativity knows no continent. What What is different is, you know, opportunity and access, the ability to express it. And I'm just sort of curious, like, why do we, why, why should this even be a radical idea at this point in our lives? It seems like it's radical now um, because I think I, I feel at least the political discourse in, especially North America and mm-hmm. in Europe, has become very, very polarized, and uh, we seem to be retrenching ourselves at different ends of the political spectrum and unable to engage in dialogue across the middle. And so terms like the West and Western civilization have either become terms for um, sticking up on a statue pedestal and lionizing and saying that they are untouchable for one side of the political spectrum. And on the other side of the political spectrum, they've almost become dirty words. They are something shameful or something that we we, had to be denigrated. Um, And both of those things are clearly pastiches they're, they're, they're straw men. These are two straw men. Um, and so if, if we cannot move past that, if we can't get the, a, a, more, a more sophisticated, less two-dimensional straw man view of what Western society and what the West currently is, we're never going to be able to move forward. But why do you think there's such a, uh, an, an aggressive move now to uphold this specific view of you know, Western civilization? Not just in the United States, but we see this in other other, you know, Western governments, this this desire to kind of narrow the focus of history rather than broaden it. Like, why do you think that is? I think this is because we are at a critical juncture in kind of the balance of power globally, mm-hmm. where the West is no longer occupying this unrivaled position of dominance, which it has had uh, for uh, the last couple of centuries. Um, we've had the recent challenges of, well, Russia, especially with the war in Ukraine, Russian aggression, but perhaps even even more importantly is, is the rise of, of China, both economically um, and also politically as well. Now, wherever you stand, stand on that, whether you think this is a good thing or a bad mm-hmm. thing in different parts of the world, it is something which is means that the world order is changing that uh, mm-hmm. things are changing around uh, around the West, um, not just within China, but also China's interactions with the rest of the world. Um, and the West therefore has to rethink its position and what it fundamentally is. 
in doing that, there are people who want to step back and retrench and maybe put their hands over their ears and say, it's it's not happening. The West is what it always was. It can't change. It's never going to change. Mm-hmm. And there are some people who are, you know, who see the faults of the West and want to al- almost rip it, rip it to shreds. But th- there are there are also some people in the middle who are seeking to try and understand what the West is now and it's not what it was 100 years ago it's not what it was 150 years ago it's not what it was even 20 years ago so the kinds of identity we need in the west now are not the kinds of identity we need um, at the time that this idea of western civilization was being promoted we need something else and we need it now you say very clearly that your book is not an attack on the west say more about that and and why you made a point of saying that i made a point of saying this because there is there is a school or a political corner which does want to critique the west and western civilization um saying that there's nothing good about it and it's all to be denigrated and acknowledging some of the horrors of the past in 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 western history and i think we must acknowledge those horrors and we must come to face to face with them mm. but that does there's not means to say that uh, the west in the current world is something that you should give up on now i am i am of the west I live in the West. I I do have a Chinese mother and I have family roots in in China, Um, but I am of the West. And there are things which I cherish and value um, as which which I think are core to modern 21st century Western identity. And in political debates nowadays around me, there are it's obvious there are other people who see those things as core to Western identity, too. And these are principles such as democracy, the rule of law, freedom of speech, freedom of worship. Or we could we could debate which ones we want to include and exclude. But the core values of the West as I see it, and as many people around me seem to see it, are no longer racial or ethnic Mm -hmm. in the same way as they were 100 um, or 70 or even 50 years ago. And so this new, this current West, um, which we're now living in today, is the West that I think we need to seek to understand and which we need to find a new origin myth for. Nisha McSweeney, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Mm -hmm. Thank you.